are now on to Chronicle digs deep into the past to unearth some of the myths and legends surrounding the Incas. It was dark, and the Creator made the sun, moon, and stars. And when the sun was ascending into heaven, very brilliant, it called to the Incas and said, Thou and thy descendants are to be lords, and are to subjugate many nations. Look upon me as thy father, and thou shalt be my children, and thou shalt worship me as thy father. Thus it was that they were called children of the sun, and that the son was worshipped and revered as a father. Machu Picchu, in Peru, is probably the most famous of all Inca sites. Why it was built is still a mystery. Buried for centuries beneath dense undergrowth, it was rediscovered only 70 years ago, when archaeologists were more interested in finding treasures and mummies than in analysing the less sensational fragments of everyday life. Archaeologists now see this small mundane research as crucial in the understanding of a people, and today, they are engaged in projects which teams with no dreams of dramatic discoveries will take years to complete. What can we learn from their extraordinary road system? What were the administrative centers like which were built along them? Can the ancient agricultural system be used to rescue a once flourishing area from abject poverty? Until their discovery by the Spanish in the 16th century, the Incas were the last advanced civilization completely isolated from the rest of mankind. But what was the Inca Empire? Not just one region, but an enormous network of roads and centers which stretched thousands of miles across the Andes. There had been earlier well-organized states, but none of the size and scale of the Incas. Originally, it's thought they were one of many small mountain kingdoms, always in competition and often at war. It wasn't until about 1440 that the sudden expansion of the empire began, and in less than a hundred years they had conquered multitudes of different groups. The emperor ruled from his capital of Cusco, 12,000 feet above sea level. He was the Inca, and his power was absolute. He governed through an elite or aristocracy descendants of Inca rulers. These were the Incas. Everyone else was a mere subject, conquered people. Today, Cusco has a population of 143,000, many of them Indians whose ancestors lived under the rule of the Incas. The Inca capital was destroyed in 1536, 
when invading Spanish forces came in search of gold. Although they ransacked the capital, remains of the Inca walls can still be seen beneath later buildings. These few gold pieces are all that survive of the Inca's golden treasures. But the Spanish did leave chronicles giving their account of how the empire functioned. Since the Incas themselves could not write, these were based on eyewitness accounts collected by Spanish priests and soldiers. Nowhere in this kingdom of Peru was there a city with the air of nobility that Cusco possessed, for this was the capital of the empire of the Incas and their royal seat. There was a good-sized square, and from this square, four highways emerged, leading to the different provinces of the kingdom. Just as the Spanish conceived of their country through the division of provinces, the Incas conceived of their great land by means of their roads. The roads pushed out to all corners of the empire, covering over 2,000 miles from Ecuador to central Chile, transporting armies, administrators, and food to the expanding frontiers. Archaeologists are only just beginning to understand the really massive extent of the roads and the hundreds of centres built along them. Dr John Hislop is involved in a five-year project to study the system, possibly the most extensive of ancient road networks. The Inca system that we know about, and that's perhaps only a small portion of what actually existed, was larger than the Roman system and perhaps larger than prehistoric systems of roads built either in parts of Africa or in parts of China. We have a general idea of where the Inca road passes in many areas because in early written uh, documents from the 16th century and the early part of the 17th century, uh, there are lists of the way stations which were placed along the side of the Inca road. Therefore, the ancient road which connects these way stations is uh, very often the Inca road. Mm -hmm. I, momento, I, I solo una mención nada para Cañete. Un... Y nada de un lateral. No hay. The objective is not to follow Inca roads and look only at the roads, but to look at the nature of the Inca remains beside the roads so as to better understand the structure of the empire. This particular site, we know from certain 16th century chronicles, was used in the conquest of a major coastal valley. And the site is really quite impressive, being almost half a mile across. And in this case, we decided to spend a bit of extra time so as to make a record of the significance of the place. In the past, there's been a general interest in studying only that which is relatively large or spectacular. But my uh, objective is to look at the many small way stations and posts that lined the Inca roads to better understand the nuts and bolts of the administrative system. Once we have a site near an Inca road, we begin examining the surface of the earth uh, within and around the site. And we will crisscross the area in which we find artifacts on the surface. And uh, this is a relatively accurate way of then later determining that the site was eight hectares in size or that it was 25 hectares in size, uh, merely by noticing over which areas uh, artifacts were present. Now, these artifacts I was able to collect in just about 10 or 15 minutes from the surface of this site, and I can see immediately that it's really quite a rich site. Very often you really don't know what you've got until you wash them off. Here we have a row of black triangles, a typically Inca design. Oh, here, here's one, it's kind of fun. Uh, let's see how well this one comes off. This is the head of a bird. Would probably have been attached to an Inca plate. It's kind of nice looking, isn't it?
Here's a colorful one. Let's just see what it. Geometric design in black, white, red. Probably off the neck of an Inca storage vessel. In the memory of people, I doubt there is a record of another highway comparable to this, running through deep valleys and over high mountains, through piles of snow, quagmires, living rock, along turbulent rivers. In some places it ran smooth and paved, carefully laid out. In others, over sierras, cut through the rock with walls skirting the rivers and steps and rests through the snow. Everywhere it was clean swept and kept free of rubbish, with lodgings, storehouses, and temples to the sun along the way. Oh, can anything comparable be said of Alexander or of any of the mighty kings who ruled the world that they built such a road or provided the supplies to be found on this one? And it was built in the shortest space of time imaginable. The Inca roads uh, have certain characteristics of a transport system that was not utilized by wheeled vehicles. The road tends to ascend mountains very rapidly. It doesn't zigzag its way up usually. And in its dramatic ascents in certain parts, there are tremendous sets of stairways, sometimes thousands of steps. Another characteristic of the Inca roads in many sections are the Inca bridges themselves. In the past weeks, I traversed a section of over 100 kilometers of Inca roads where I was able to observe the bases of at least a dozen Inca bridges. Within the Inca Empire, there existed a, a complex system of runners that were located every few kilometers along the roads and that would relay messages from one point to another. It's known, or at least early Spanish manuscripts tell us uh, from their Inca informants, that a message could be sent literally uh, 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers in a period of less than a week. The kingdom of Peru was so vast that if the Lord Inca happened to be at one end of his territory, he had to be informed of what was going on at the other by messenger. They had things so well organized that in a week, the news was carried by messengers from Quito to Cusco. For this, every half league, they had a small house, and as soon as the news to be relayed reached it, one of the messengers set out on the run and did not stop for half a league. And before he arrived at the next house, he shouted out what had happened and was to be said. As soon as this was heard by the other, he ran another half league with such speed that the country being as rough and broken as it is, neither horses nor mules could travel more swiftly. We're going to have data that leads to a greater understanding of a number of questions about the Inca Empire. We're going to know, for example, more about the actual extent of the road system. We're going to know more about the placement of way stations along the road and with which frequency and at which distances these way stations are placed. We're going to know more about, well, in general, the nature of Inca administration, transport, and communication. There are other things that I think that we must study that may in the long run tell us more about Incas. The whole question of storage and the preservation of foodstuffs is extremely important. The whole question of agricultural techniques and the nature of the foot plow. No taxes or tribute in the form of money were payable by the populace to the Inca or anyone else. The individual discharged his duty towards the empire through work and service. 
The ancient tribute was to sow crops for the Inca and for religion, and to reap them and carry the harvests to the storehouses, where there was always a superfluity. No one who was lazy or tried to live by the work of others was tolerated. Everyone had to work. Thus, on certain days, each lord went to his lands and took the plough in hand and cultivated the earth and did other things. Even the Incas themselves did this to set an example, for everybody was to know that there should be nobody so rich that on this account he might disdain or affront the poor. And under their system there was none such in all the kingdom, for if he had his health, he worked and lacked for nothing, and if he was ill, he received what he needed from the storehouses. At all times there shall be food in abundance throughout the land. Maize, potato, yucca and other crops shall be cultivated on a large scale. All crops, including green vegetables, shall be arranged in sequence so that the people have food to eat during the whole year. In former times all this area was densely populated and full of cultivated fields, so many of them and so large that it was a pleasure to see, laid out as they were with broad terraces from which ran others with space between to plant the maize and other products they raised. This is the way they were built, clinging to the sides of the mountains. Many of these fields are planted with wheat, for it does well. At the time of the sowing, all had to be present to divide the crops. The lands belonged to the village, and he who did not work in the sowing had no share in the harvest. Inca terraces are still cultivated with the foot plough, although more modern methods have been introduced in the valleys. Yet the overall harvest yield is small. No one since the Incas has achieved equal mastery of this difficult terrain. The Inca gave orders that flocks of llama should be reared in great numbers, and every year a fixed number of these llama were slaughtered as a tithe in honor of the sun. They are very tame and make no noise. The llamas can carry loads of two or three arobas easily, and when they can no longer work, there is no loss, for the meat is good. The flock of the community was shorn at the proper season, and the wool was divided amongst the people, each getting the quantity he required for himself, his wife and children, so that all were clothed. The terrain is easier terrain for people and yamas than it is for vehicles in many respects, so that I'm sure it must have been much easier for the Inca to establish uh, their settlement up here than it has been for us to uh, come up here and do the work. Of course, we're not used to uh, high altitudes, we're not used to moving things back and forth great distances the way they were. For the last 10 years, Dr. Craig Morris has been making regular trips from his laboratory in Huanaco to the archaeological site high up in the Andes. It takes anywhere from 6 to 30 hours, depending on the road conditions. And uh, one has to worry about avalanches and the usual problems of supplying a camp from some distance. It was their custom when the Incas were making a progress through any part of this great kingdom to travel with great pomp and style in rich litters set upon smooth poles of the finest wood and adorned with gold and silver in keeping with their habits. And except when it was to the state's interest, they did not travel more than four leagues a day. And so that there would be adequate supplies for their men, every four leagues there were lodgings and storehouses abundantly supplied with everything to be found in these regions. In this manner the Inca travelled through his kingdom for the time he liked, seeing with his own eyes what was taking place and ordering what he thought necessary.
The ruins of Huanaco Pampa cover two square miles on a high plateau. It was a major center on the Inca road running north from Cusco to Quito. Large centers like this were built about every hundred miles, with smaller ones in between. Most of the buildings are of rough stones. Only important structures had fine masonry, and excavations by Dr. Morris and his team are almost complete. Analysis of the material would take a further two years. What we were trying to do from the very beginning was to choose one of the administrative capitals in a sense to try to reconstruct the activities and the pattern of life and the way it functioned. And the reason Monaco Pampa was chosen was really quite simple, that it is the best preserved of the large administrative centers along the Highland Road network. The first strategy was to make a complete map of the city since uh, it is one of the few cities where one can get a complete ground plan. And when we're dealing with a city that had approximately 4,000 structures, you can immediately see that we have our work cut out for us. Uh, the idea was to excavate a sample of those buildings that was somehow representative of the city as a whole. We wanted to get away from the old-fashioned methods where people spent all their time digging temples and palaces. We wanted to see what the whole city was like. And one of the things that I think is most interesting about it is, in a sense, they're rather artificial in that they were built quickly by the Inca and not only populated from the outside, but then supplied, essentially, from the outside. Uh, one of the basic things to understand about the organization of the empire is that the, most of the um, uh, income, shall we say, the taxes of the Inca were collected in terms of labor. And much, most of this was done in terms of farming state fields and so on and so forth to actually provide the goods which supported the state apparatus. But uh, in addition to that, some of this labor was used in the city. And the people would come to the city during certain times of the year as best we can reconstruct it and serve their period of labor tax on a rotating basis. And this, of course, gives the city a very strange character. Our normal idea of a city, which is a large permanent population, probably wasn't characteristic of these places at all. And one of the reasons that we see all of this uh, sort of abandoned very quickly after the Spanish came was uh, simply that the administrative structure which made all function had fallen apart. The local leaders, the local uh, chiefs, were the ones who were responsible for seeing that people came and served their labor tax when, at the appointed time. But the Inca kept great track of it uh, uh, on their quipu system. The quipus are long strands of knotted strings, and those who were the accountants and understood the meaning of these knots could reckon by them expenditures or other things that had taken place many years before. By these knots, they counted from one to ten, and from ten to a hundred, and from a hundred to a thousand. On one of these strands there is the account of one thing and on the other of another in such a way that what to us is a strange, meaningless account is clear to them. Uh, since they've never been studied all that thoroughly yet, uh, we can't really read them in a sense, but uh, they provide the record keeping which is absolutely necessary to make anything of the size of the Inca Empire, of course, function. You simply couldn't do it without something that could substitute for writing, and they didn't have writing in the sense that we usually think of it. Um, but they had the keeper, which was extremely sophisticated mathematically and uh, served all the functions that, that one really needed. One of their important functions was to keep an account of the food supplies. At Wanaka Pampa alone, the storehouses could hold one million bushels of potatoes and maize. The cold temperature of the high altitude chosen for their sites created ideal storage conditions. The Inca had arrived at uh, the same point in storage technology which in the West we achieved about in about 1935. They uh, knew how to take advantage of an environment which they understood very well, how to put various kinds of resources together. And uh, in some respects, I think uh, they did it much better than we do it these days. In each of the many provinces, there were many storehouses filled with supplies and other needful things. Thus, in times of war, Wherever the armies went, they drew upon the contents of these storehouses. If there came a lean year, the storehouses were opened and the provinces were lent what they needed in the way of supplies. Then, in a year of abundance, they paid back all that they had received. The city is rather remarkable in that, since it was abandoned very quickly, most of the artifacts were left very near where they were used. 
We have somewhere between 10 and 15 tons of uh, shards of pottery, uh, which is more than I hope any other archaeologist ever has to cope with. And we've spent the last two years, really, uh, and we'll spend the next year coding all of this for computerization. Each diagnostic shard, a rim or a handle or uh, some such thing, is categorized according to the vessel form, whether it came from a plate or a jar or a bowl, for example. And then a series of measurements are made basically to determine the size of the vessel. Um, and basically what we're doing is really very simple in theory. We, we want to know uh, how many plates and how many jars and how many bowls and how many cooking pots were associated with the various structures and then we will compare various parts of the city on the basis of these form and size characteristics. Let's see what we've got here. 93.7% jars in zone 8, which is the storage zone and is exactly what we expected. Some of the other things not quite so close, but still a high percentage of jars in zone 2, which does go along with the beer making notion. It's interesting that in zone 4 we're getting more cooking pots outside the houses than inside the houses, which uh, would tend to suggest that they're doing their cooking out of doors, which is interesting. Nice to see two and a half tons of pot shards uh, condensed to a little bitty piece of paper. Perhaps the most surprising area in the excavations was the part of town that uh, has the most uh, elaborate architecture. It's obviously, since it has big plazas in it and very elaborate uh, stonework, in a sense the most important part of town. And we had a, at the beginning thought, the, thought of this as sort of the bureaucratic center of the town where all the decisions are made. And we began excavations thinking that the buildings would probably mostly be empty because bureaucratic activities maybe have uh, quipus and such things and that wouldn't be preserved. And we immediately started finding tons of pottery, uh, piles and piles and piles of broken jars. And it's quite evident that uh, this part of town was a kind of uh, official hospitality center where people got together and to drink a lot of the uh, of the local beer local maize beer which is called chicha uh, public feasts in which people were known to imbibe perhaps a bit too much from some of the descriptions in the chronicles uh, they were very important and they seem to have been a vital aspect of uh, keeping the labor tax system going. In other words, the way you got the people to work for is that you'd be very generous to them. You would give them all the maize beer they could drink and uh, treat them well. And the evidence we have here suggests that they were treated quite well. And so, making the people joyful and giving their solemn banquets and drinking feasts, great takis and other celebrations such as they use, completely different from ours, the Incas showed their splendor and all the feasting was at their expense, where there were vessels of silver and gold and goblets and other things. When the Lord Incas ruled this kingdom, in the capitals of the provinces, they had great numbers of women known as mamacunas. They made chicha, which is the wine they drink, of which they always had great vessels. They also wove and dyed woolen garments for the service of the temple. There were a group of women who seemed to play actually a variety of roles, all of which were very critical to the functioning of the empire. Uh, the chronicles are full of references to them, although the descriptions frequently are not all that clear, but they were supposed to have uh, somehow maintained their virginity and to have served uh, largely religious functions. But it's also quite clear that they did a lot of things which were economically important. In a sense, they did kind of the, the tasks that women did in Andean society, but on a massive scale for the state.
Textiles and costumes were very important. In the Andes, from extremely early periods, textiles actually predate pottery in the, in the Andes. Uh, during the Inca period, we see the importance of textiles um, emphasized by the fact that people were more or less uh, required to wear the costumes of their native area so that uh, if, they, if they were traveling about the realm, people would, at a glance, be able to see where they came from. The Incas ordered that the dress of each village should be different that it might be known to what village or tribe an Indian belonged. No member of any tribe shall wear clothing different from that customarily worn in that tribe on pain of 100 strokes of the lash. As soon as the Incas had made themselves lords of a province, they caused the natives, who had previously been widely scattered, to live in communities with an officer over every 10, another over every 100, another over every 1,000, another over every 10,000, and an Inca governor over all, who reported upon the administration every year, recording the births and the deaths that had occurred among men and flocks, the yield of the crops, and all other details with great minuteness. <laughs> Many Indians still wear their traditional costumes, speak the Inca language of Quechua, weave and drink chicha. Here, a few miles from Cusco, in the village of Chinchero, a weekly market is now held in the square of the old Inca site. All who were subjugated were taught that Cusco was the abode and home of the gods. Throughout that city, there was not a fountain, nor a well, nor a wall, which they did not say contained some mystery as appears in the report on the places of worship in that city, where more than 400 such places are enumerated. A Benedictine monastery now covers the remains of their most important religious site, the Corricancha, or Temple of the Sun. Earthquakes have revealed many of the Inca walls lying beneath the monastery. These show the ingenious stonework of the Inca masons with the characteristic Inca feature trapezoidal doorways and niches. Originally, these walls were covered with gold, and in one room there was a huge golden disc representing the sun. Although the Spanish stripped the temple of its treasure, most of its walls and those of the rest of the city defied destruction. One other contribution and tribute in the time of the Incas was the demand for Indians to work at the edifices of Cusco. This work was very toilsome, for all their buildings were of masonry, and they had no tools of iron or steel, either to hew the stones out of the quarries or to shape them afterwards. All this was done with other stones, which was a labor of extreme difficulty. They did not use lime and sand, but adjusted one stone to another with such precision that the point of junction is scarcely visible. To the north of the city, on the hill closest to it, there is a fortress, Saxwaman, which by reason of its size and strength was once a mighty building. There are stones of such size and magnificence in these walls that it baffles the mind to think how they could be brought up and set in place. Some of these stones are about 12 feet wide and over 20 long. Others are as thick as an ox and also exactly set that a coin could not be inserted between them. If we consider the number of times they must have fitted and taken off one stone before this accuracy was attained, an idea may be formed of the toil and of the number of workmen that was required. Cusco was the heart of the empire and so had the most elaborate architecture. As the empire expanded, other impressive structures were built along the neighboring Urubamba Valley, leading to the most spectacular site of all, Machu Picchu. But this site would probably never have been built had it not been for Cusichaca, just a few miles up the valley. 
less exciting to look at with its small fort of rough stones, but of more fundamental importance as the major source of food. This area has been the subject of research for an Anglo-Peruvian project led by Dr. Anne Kendall. The idea of building Machu Picchu probably would have come after establishing the first necessities in an area like this, which is that of sort of um, agricultural, economic viability. Otherwise, Machu Picchu would have been a very isolated position and site. Having decided that this was a prime area for agricultural development, I think perhaps a force of engineers and meter was the Inca's public workforce and sent in here and they organized the work, building this fort, which is in a position to sort of oversee and secure an area. The fort overlooked the vast agricultural schemes below, a network of terraces and canals providing food for the growing empire. Many of the canals flowed from the Cusichaca River and some are still in use today, but now they carry only a fraction of the water they once did as they thread their way down the valley. Most are leaking or broken, and many have dried up altogether. When the Incas ruled, the area flourished. There was a thriving population of over a thousand people. Now it has dwindled to a tiny and impoverished community. Had the Incas' success been simply a matter of modifying systems taken over from the people they had conquered? Or had they introduced new ideas of their own? A study of their agricultural scheme, starting with the fort, may give some of the answers. Um, we'd like to find out what the composition, the social composition of the fort was, whether these were people, um, any of the military brought in from Cusco, whether the people were transplanted from another area, whether, in fact, there are some of our pre-Incas from this area re-housed in the fort under supervision, In one room, they discovered that an upper story had collapsed, sealing off the remains of Inca occupation below. This may prove to be a rich source of information. Pottery from all parts of the fort is taken down to the camp to be washed and analyzed under the supervision of Sarah Lunt, who is in charge of the finds. A study of the fabric and paste of the fragments indicates that the type of pottery made before the Inca occupation continued to be made after their arrival, then gradually changed to the more standardized Inca version. This suggests that the local people did continue to live here, slowly adapting to the new order. Separating minute remains from the soil may provide clues to the strain of maize used so successfully by the Incas. We top the tank up with water and then um, start the engine and put the bubbling mechanism into the tank and then tip the samples in. The idea being that carbonized plant remains such as charcoal and seeds will float and be carried over the weir into the sieves. And after about 30 seconds we switch them, the engine off and take the bubbler out and then we keep the residue in a crate at the bottom of the machine, um, washing out the silt through the mesh at the bottom, and um, dry both the float and the residue and sort through them both later, um, particularly the float, which I will do under a microscope to look for seeds, charcoal, and any animal remains that also might be there. We hope to be able to identify the seeds and charcoal down to the species level to um, give us an indication of what plants were used by the Incas for food, perhaps, things they'd grown. And this will supplement information on the general economic activity of the people, which is produced by the finding of artefacts and pottery on the site. The research will continue for another season. Only after further analysis in London can any firm conclusions be reached. Dr. Kendall's team work for four months during the dry season. They include botanists, geologists, soil and irrigation specialists, as well as students and British soldiers. All are volunteers.
They hope that their studies of the Inca agricultural system will help today's farmers. It's a project that the Peruvian authorities are very enthusiastic about. Dr. Kendall also visits local people in the area. A study of the way they live now may help in the interpretation of data emerging from the archaeological site. It does help to do an ethnographic study, i.e. looking at um, some of the contemporary dwellings, some of which are even in Inca structures. This is an Inca house. Senora Beja's family have lived here for several generations. Dr. Kendall interviews Senora Beja and her daughter in a mixture of Quechua and Spanish. Oh, they're usually very friendly. They're a bit sort of perplexed sometimes when I stare at the floor and sort of ask them how many times they brush the house after today. Because, um, of course, that interests us too. That the floors tend to wear away. And this tallies with some of the evidence that we find in the excavations. Guinea pigs, as in Inca times, are a vital part of the diet and are reared in corners of the kitchen. And Inca niches are still used to store belongings. We're looking at the activity areas in the houses, where they do things. Um, we're looking at the local farmers, how they irrigate and when they irrigate. Um, we're looking at the crops they grow, where they get their seeds from, what the relationship is between the people who farm in the lower part of the valley and those that farm in the upper part of the valley. Where there's considerable economic stability was achieved by the Incas and where that security has in rural areas been replaced by a rather below subsistence standard of living. Everything we can learn about the successful agriculture, traditional technology and rural administration systems of the past should really be relevant to revitalizing the areas that are now so depressed. Siempre da buena producción en el terreno negro. En el terreno negro. Sí, porque en, en las alturas son terreno negro y... Da mejor ahí arriba. Da mejor en las alturas, pero... It's no good, I think, pretending to be social scientists. All we can do is to provide some technical advice and encouragement on the basis of what we've learnt about the proved traditional system. In the building of irrigation canals, I doubt that there has ever been a people or nation in the world who conducted and constructed them over such rough and difficult terrain. The team's greatest contribution is in helping to restore the canal system. They work along the traditional Inca lines with the help of a trained mason from the Peruvian Institute of Culture.
Well, this is an Inca canal, and a couple of months ago it gave way, and the locals have shored it up with some wood. Now the mason has recut another um, ledge to, to build a wall up from, and then the local people have been bringing these slates in, which are going to be to line the canal. So we're going to redo it um, the same way that the Incas originally would have done it. With one small change, we're going to set the stones with cement on the ledge so that the granite doesn't disintegrate quickly again. Initially, I don't think they believed that anyone would be interested in putting a hand in on their work unless there was some sort of obvious reward for us. But they've got used to it now because in 77 we corrected two bits of canal which had completely fallen down and they've held up pretty well and so they invited us in and actually sort of requested help. If they work with us on one or two of these jobs, then they can carry on doing them and maintaining the canals along the same lines. But their plans are not confined to restoring the existing canals. They hope to open up a whole area that is no longer in use. Only the stones sticking out of the grass indicate that this was once a canal. Can it be restored? Technically, we think it's feasible. All the studies we've done so far are pointing in that direction. It's now really a question of encouraging or seeing if the local people are going to carry it through, because it means a lot of work on their part. They've got to clean out the old canal, they've got to shore it up and work on it. So there's no way we can say to them, you have to carry out our idea. On the contrary, it has to be them who say, we now okay. want to carry out your idea, how do we do it? Perhaps it's not surprising that the Inca's method of agriculture is being revived to rescue people of the 20th century from their poverty. For the Incas understood their environment and knew how to make the best use of its resources. In a word, the Incas did not make their conquests just for the sake of being served and collecting tribute. In this respect, they were far ahead of us. For with the order they introduced, the people throve and multiplied and arid regions were made fertile and bountiful. And they built fortresses and strongholds and stationed captains and governors in all the provinces. They did great things and governed so well that few in the world excelled them. <laughs>